O oh, grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. To lose something of great value can be heartbreaking, especially if we personally paid a great price to get it, or if it was a gift or a family heirloom. Maybe we've lost a friend because of an unkind word, a misunderstanding, or an act that seemed to be an act of betrayal at the time, and there doesn't appear to be any repentance on their part towards us for their behavior. But even so, do we seek them out to reconnect? The parables of the lost sheep and the coins are the stories that set up the more familiar parable of the lost or the prodigal son. But each one has the same message. Something of great value was lost, and the person who lost it goes to great lengths to find it. And once it's found, they throw a party to celebrate with family and friends. Now, because these are parables, we know there's a much deeper meaning. They tell us the story of God's great search for us, his valuable children, and of his and all the angels rejoicing when we stop hiding from him and allow ourselves to be found. In the opening verses of our gospel text, that is, that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's reaching out to the disenfranchised of his society, the tax collectors and the sinners, the ones the upper-class Pharisees deemed unworthy of love or respect or even friendship. Even Jesus draws the ire of the group because he openly talks and eats and spends time with these lost sheep. See, Jesus came to offer salvation and a restored relationship with God to these sinners, these lost sheep. He came to show them and to be God's love. He never worried about what others thought about his associations. He continued to go to those who needed him, regardless of the effect these rejected people might have on his own reputation. So when he's challenged by the leaders about his association with these sinners, these lost people, he tells the first of these two parables, the parable of the lost sheep. Now to us, it might seem foolish for the shepherd to leave 99 sheep to go search for just one. But the shepherd knew that the 99 would be safe within the sheepfold, and he rejoiced that they were there. But the lost sheep was in danger because each sheep was of high value. The shepherd knew that it was worthwhile to search diligently for the lost one. See, God's love for each individual is so great that he seeks each one of us out and rejoices when we are found. But he grieves when we refuse to let him find us. See, Jesus associated with these sinners because he wanted to bring the lost sheep, people considered beyond hope, the gospel of God's kingdom. Now, many denominations preach and teach that we sinners need to find Jesus in order to be saved. But I have news for them. Jesus was never lost. It is us who have strayed. Yet Jesus is the one who finds us. Just think about the words of our very favorite hymn. I once was lost, but now I'm found. The hymn doesn't say, Jesus was lost, but now I found him. We may feel lost and alone when the world and all its troubles seem to be heaped upon us. We may think that God is far away from us when pain and suffering seems to overwhelm us. But we're not alone. God is there seeking us and offering us his comfort and his reassurance that no matter what this world throws at us, no matter where we go or what we do, 
God is still there inviting us into his arms of mercy and comfort. Jesus then goes on to tell the story of the lost coin. Again, to us who have an overabundance of material wealth here in the Western world, we may have a hard time understanding the significance of one lost coin out of ten. But you see, to a Palestinian woman of that time, that one missing coin was very important. See, Palestinian women were given ten silver coins as a wedding gift. So besides the monetary value, these coins also held sentimental value, much like a wedding ring does for us. So to lose one would be extremely distressing. If you've ever lost or misplaced a wedding ring or expensive piece of jewelry, you know the pain associated with the loss and the joy you feel when it's found. These parables tell the same story of the lost being sought and the great rejoicing when the lost have been found. Again, we are the lost that have been found by Jesus. And there is joy in heaven when we acknowledge our need for him in our lives. Now it's been suggested that we might have more joy in our churches if we went out of our way to celebrate Jesus' love and concern for the lost instead of simply focusing on the 99 or the 9 that were never gone. But I think it's a both and situation. We celebrate the 99 or the 9, but we don't forget the 1. That way, when all are found, we all, the 100 or the 10, celebrate together. Again, if you've ever lost anything of value, you know the pain and heartache of not knowing where it is. A few years ago, I watched a very disturbing movie entitled The Lovely Bones. It's about a young girl who's murdered and whose body is never found to prove that she was in fact murdered and not simply a runaway. Now the audience knew that she was murdered and by whom. And we knew where her body was. But her parents and family were left with the mystery of what happened to their lost daughter. I can only imagine the pain and sorrow families go through when a loved one is lost or missing without a trace. Now, I once shared with you the story of when our girls went missing for a while when we were living in Hannah. They had an argument with Stephen and decided not to wait for us to come and get them. So on their way home, they took a wrong turn and ended up on the wrong side of town, a long way from where they were supposed to be. While they were missing, Charlene and I searched and we prayed, and we called in the neighbors and our friends to help us find them. Well, there was great joy when they were found by our friend. And if I remember correctly, there was also a very stern lecture about after the euphoria wore off. We celebrated first, but then there were consequences. Our worry had a happy ending because they were found. And 15 years ago today, September 11, 2001, the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, the Pentagon and an airplane en route to Washington, D.C. were attacked by a terrorist group. 2,996 people lost their lives in those attacks, and many of the bodies were never recovered. Their human remains were lost forever. Many say that on that day, America lost its innocence, never to be found again because of the resulting wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that are blamed on these attacks. Now, in the months after the attack, churches of all denominations reported a higher percentage of returnees to their buildings as people sought comfort from God and the fellowship of others who were just as damaged. They were all seeking answers. They were searching for God. They were searching for what they had lost. But as the weeks turned into months and as people started to return to some sort of normal life, 
Many who had attended or returned to church only after the attacks started to leave and return to other activities. Many reported that they didn't need God anymore because they were now okay. See, they saw the church as a spiritual medicenter that helped them in their time of need instead of as the long-term care center that was there for their ongoing spiritual care. And in conversations with many of my colleagues, we report that one of our biggest disappointments is when people stay away from church without so much as a phone call or a letter letting us know why they no longer attended. When we try to contact them, they don't return phone calls or emails. It's like they've dropped off the face of the earth. It's as if they want to be lost. When we can't talk to them, we're left speculating about why they're staying away. And we can't make it right if we are at fault. Or if they do give us a reason, more often than not, it's not always the truth. And we still can't make it right. See, without an answer from them, we're left to guess that maybe people stay away from church for a while, either because life got too busy for them to consider church as a resting place rather than as one more thing to add to an already overcrowded calendar, or maybe somebody said or did something in the church that they didn't like. Or because they don't like the pastor, or the music, or the programs, or some other excuse that's convenient at the time. And the longer they stay away, the easier it becomes for them to make staying away the norm, rather than the exception. And maybe we write them off and forget about them and take an out-of-sight, out-of-mind attitude towards them. But you see, God doesn't take that attitude. Like us, they too are always front and center in God's mind. And that's where they need to be in our minds, front and center as well. See, God paid a great price for them as well as for us. God paid for their salvation through the death and resurrection of his son Jesus. And like he welcomes us into his family through the sacrament of holy baptism, he welcomed them too. And that is what makes them worthy enough for us to keep looking for them. Now many of you were away for this summer, and we missed you. We rejoice and we celebrate that you have returned safely from your travels and are back to worship and to join with us in fellowship. You were not lost. You weren't even misplaced but you were missed. But we need to take a look around us. We still have more empty pews today than we had in years past. And these pews are not the result of death. We've had very few deaths here over the past number of years, but the pews remain empty because many people have left the church, have gotten lost, and forgotten about, uh, forgotten about simply because they choose not to be here anymore. And why is that? Maybe it's because of some of the reasons I mentioned earlier. Or maybe they have excuses of their own. But the bottom line is they aren't here. And we miss them. They are the lost sheep that we, we all, not just me, but all of us, need to reach out to and invite back. Or at least find out the truth about why they're no longer coming. And then figure out together what we can do to make this place their church home again. We are here, and we celebrate each other. But let's not forget those who aren't here. Perhaps these are the people that you might like to consider inviting to next week's Back to Church Sunday. We celebrate that Jesus has found us, and he has given us the gift of eternal life. We have many opportunities to share that good news with those who may never, have, may never have heard it before, and with those who have heard it but may have forgotten it, and with those who choose not to listen for whatever reason. I pray that their choosing never stops us from sharing this good news anyway. May we join Jesus in his search for the lost so, we can join, so they can join us in heavenly celebration. The celebration that happens when even one lost soul has been found and returned to the fold of God's kingdom. Amen.
And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds on Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.